Well, good morning. Um, my name is Emily Herring. I'm the naturalist out here at the Grimes Farm. Um, I'd like to welcome you out to the Brown Bag Bunch. Uh, this is a program that Diane Hall had started um, before she retired a couple of years ago. And so we've kind of continued on. So every month we have a program like this. And if you're interested and in not on our newsletter mailing, let us know. We can get you signed up. So that way um, we can get you the information about upcoming events and programs. Um, so today we are going to highlight our uh, maple syrup program. I'm sorry for those that signed up to go out to Grammar Grove. Uh, we went out there yesterday and the roads were pretty muddy when we went out there. But um, when we got down to the parking lot, it was a gigantic ice skating rink. And then I struggled, as in the guys had to push me to get me out of the parking lot and up the hill. So we decided that it would probably be more fun if you didn't get stuck in the parking lot. And um, the trails are also uh, completely snow covered still. So um, in the timber, it takes quite a bit longer for that snow to melt. And so we've got a good eight inches still of snow in uh, Grammar Grove. Um, but we do have our trees tapped. So uh, we, um, Jeremiah and Tyler uh, and Olivia tapped them last Wednesday and uh, they tapped 153 trees. And so we will be uh, hopefully making syrup if the sun decides to shine and we warm up and it get cold at night. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, so we've kind of named our, our maple syrup program here, Trees to Table, um, as a play on the fact that uh, we are getting natural food from our woods and bringing it uh, to your table. And a little later, we'll let you sample some of that delicious uh, syrup. So a little bit about the history of maple syruping. It started with Native Americans. Obviously, they did not have sugar sources like uh, Europeans did. And so um, in the very beginning, and there's lots of myths behind how they figured out maple syrup came to be. One of them was that, uh, or tales, we're not 100% sure, but one of them was that there was, um, it was in the winter time, or this time of year, and there was a wound on a tree and it was leaking fluid. Instead of going all the way to get water, they decided to collect that because they tasted like water. And so they collected that and then they cooked meat in it and the meat had a very sweet flavor to it and they realized that, that there was sugar in that water. It wasn't just water is, is one of the tales, whether or not that's 100% true, we're not sure. Um, but so they started this process and of course settlers used it as well but the very first process would have been a log dug out with rocks heated up in a fire and put in to the sap to cook it down now as a person who has spent hours upon hours cooking down sap I could not imagine that process <laughs> and how valuable that maple syrup had to be to them um, us uh, humans nowadays are so hooked on sugar and we take it for granted how available it is but something back then so sweet it would have been I'm sure very valuable to them. Uh, settlers then produced moved into producing it in large metal um, pots over a uh, fire and really that's kind of how it had been up until uh, modern evaporators came into the picture. In fact even just our first our first um, method of cooking down sap was in a large metal pan over a fire. Now we do have a modern evaporator here at the Grimes Farm. We still use wood to um, heat our uh, sap up uh, and help evaporate off that water. Um, but it is in a, a, a setup like this. And a little later on, we'll, we, if you want to, you can go over and check out our sugar shack and our evaporator. The guys are getting it up running. It doesn't have sap in it, it has water in it because we don't have any sap yet. Uh, now, last year we had sap at this time, but you know, Mother Nature, she's in control. And next step uh, is osmosis systems. So osmosis systems, what they do is they actually, reverse osmosis systems, we remove the water from the sap before um, it, you cook it down, so it helps the cook down process quite a bit quicker. So to start, anybody can make maple syrup. Anybody can make maple syrup. All you have to do is have a maple tree. Now, there's multiple different types of maple trees. And there's another maple tree that I don't have on this um, 
on this picture and that's red maple. Um, you can use red maples as well. Uh, most commonly though we think of the black and sugar maple um, as the trees to tap and those are the ones that we prefer to tap. They're the preferred trees because um, they actually take a little longer to bud out in the spring and that budding out process is important because once the trees start to bud out, the flavor of the sap changes and it doesn't taste good anymore. So you want to be able to collect as much sap as possible in a very short window of time. Now, the previous two years, we had really long sap collecting periods, about a month each. This year, we're not sure what we're going to have yet. So um, we're about a week, we would say, behind where we were last year. But the sugar and, and black maple, they have a higher percentage of sugar in their sap. So, you know, if you have a lower percentage of sugar, you're just gonna get less maple syrup because the maple syrup is condensed sugar from the sap. If you have lower levels of sugar, then you're just gonna get less maple syrup for what you have collected. So it's, it's really good though, these two have, usually have higher levels of sugar. Um, in fact, we say with these two that you're looking at about um, four, you, to you, about a 40, out of 40 gallons of sap, you're gonna get one gallon of syrup. So these are the higher levels, although silver maple sometimes do. It's kind of interesting. It completely depends on the tree. And so part of our um, process of this is this year is we're going to start testing the sugar levels in each of the trees to see which trees have higher sugar levels. And then we'll know, okay, this tree has a higher sugar level than this tree, so we'll tap this tree, but this one's really low. So next year we won't tap that tree because there's no point in tapping a tree that has really low sugar level if all we're doing is getting a bunch of water instead. We also measure all the water we collect as well, so we kind of, or all the sap that we collect, so we could kind of know which trees are larger producers than others. Um, the Will that change season to season? It, it could. That we're, we're kind of, we want to include the scientific process and research into this whole activity. Um, so when we get more students out there, they too can participate in figuring out which trees are the good producers, doing some scientific um, studies and things like that. Now this tree right here, but Manitoba, Manitoba maple, if you've ever seen maple syrup advertised as having Manitoba maple, that's actually the box elder which is part of the maple tree, or maple tree family. Um, it has a different flavor in its sap, but you can collect sap from it. But it, they say it produces more of a molasses flavored syrup than a, what we would think of as maple syrup. Um, Norway maples, uh, there has been some research on tapping them. Their sap is a little bit different, um, but still can produce syrup. Um, and then there's a lot of different cultivated species of maples out there as well. So if you have a maple tree, all you have to do is tap it. And that sounds easy, right? And it is. It really is. You have to drill a hole, put a tap in it, and then something to collect it. And it can be very simple um, or as a, a, just a metal. Uh, sometimes people actually use twigs, hollow twigs. So they drill a hole into the tree, use a hollow twig, and that's their spout that will collect the sap and run it in. Um, but there's all different types of, of spiles out there. Um, the kind of the older ones are the metal ones. This is what we, we used the, some of these the first year. We kind of did a mix. And the metal ones, you can hook a bucket. So this goes into the tree. You hook your bucket here, and then the bucket hangs down, and then it drips into the bucket. We like these, they're, they're kind of the, tri, uh, the traditional ones, but what happens is when this drips into the bucket, everything else drips into the bucket too, or can easily get into the bucket. And oftentimes there's covers you could put over them, but it doesn't keep things like ants out and other creatures as well. So we um, actually switched over to plastic spiles. And these are very similar to the ones we have out at um, Grammar Grove. And then we run a tube. And then the tube goes into a bucket that has a hole on it. And it, it's a tight fit in there. So we get very little contaminant from the outside world with this. So I'll pass these around. 
We actually have special drill bits that we use, but you don't have to, um, that are made for tapping the trees. I don't know if I'll be able to get this open or not. And these are, I want to say 5 16 There's different sizes. You can get 5 16 or 7 16 depending on the size of your spiles. And you're literally going to put this um, into a drill. Now, hand drills, kind of the, the traditional way of doing it. It said you don't want to go too fast when you're drilling your hole because it can actually kind of um, burn over the edges of the pores and so you're not getting that sap to release as well. So, but we do use a, a hand drill because when you're tapping 150 trees, you have to be also reasonable in your process. And I'll pass this around. It looks just like a regular drill bit. Um, and then that way, we just do it on a very low speed. And when you drill, you'll see in that first picture up there, he's drilling at a little bit of an angle. That little bit of an angle is so the sap obviously can run down and it doesn't sit in the hole. You don't want it to sit in the hole because it won't come out, one. And two, um, it can cause some rot and problems inside the tree if you do that. Mm. It will back up. Yep. So the whole process, and I'm not going to get into this too much detail, detail because it's a little bit above my head <laughs> when it comes to the process of the sap actually coming out of the tree. So more or less what's happening is there's two different pressures. When it's cold, there's a negative pressure. When it's warm, there's a positive pressure. And when those, the tree's temperatures change, and it's actually warmer up above than it is down below, that causes the sap to go up and down. So as the days get warmer, there's a positive pressure that causes the sap to go up. And when the days get colder, there's a negative pressure and causes the sap to go down, and that process goes up and down. Now, it's not uncommon for plants to have this, but it's, it, it's pretty rare with the maples um, bee species itself to have this up and down process to be able to collect the sap. So we tap the spile into place, and when we're tapping it into place, it literally um, is a tap, 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 very gentle. You don't want to hit it in there too hard, because if you put it in too hard, it'll actually split the wood, and that will cause the sap to leak all over. You want to get that spile set in there, um, set in there just right, just tight enough that the sap is forced to go through the spile, down the tube, and into the bucket. Um, and if you do it too hard, it will cause it to split, and then that sap will just leak down the side of the tree. Um, so we actually have little hammers that we take into the field and just kind of a gently, and it, it does have a sound that once you tap, tap, and there's kind of a thud, and you know that it's set in there tight enough. Question, can you put more than one tap in a tree? Yes, you can. So it, <laughs> it's interesting because, um, when we first started this process, you start doing all this research on the internet. And we had a gentleman over at Iowa State, Jesse Randall. He was the extension forester over there for a while. He came from a maple syruping family. He actually came from New York, and his parents own a maple syrup making business. And he taught us a lot. And so some of the stuff he was teaching was different than what we were learning on the internet versus I was told by a guy from Wisconsin, go out and get this book. It's Maple Syrup Production Producer's Manual. I quickly found that there's a lot of different opinions on what way you should do it and what is the best way to do it. Um, and one of the things is the number of taps you put into a tree. So when we're tapping our trees, our number one concern is the health of our trees. We do not want to cause any damage to the health of our trees. Lots of times you'll say, they'll see that they say if your tree is 36 inches in diameter that you can put three to four taps in that tree. Well, that's not very conservative, and that's probably not looking at the best interests of the tree. That's more about getting more sap and syrup from your, your tree. So um, for conservative reasons, we have chosen just to put no more than two taps in per tree, even though we do have some trees that are over 36 inches in diameter out at the, at the Grammar Grove. Uh-huh. <coughs> so that's a good question. And no, it doesn't. In fact, that's why I kind of wanted to show this picture up here. I don't know if you guys can see very well, but this right there is the tap from the previous year. So literally, you cannot, it's very hard to see where the tap from the previous year is at. Now, when we tap our trees, we want to make sure that we rotate. 
So if you were to take your tree and you tap it all the way around, you're damaging the xylem and the phloem, which is the part that makes the energy in the water go up and down the tree all the way around. If you want to kill a tree, you just have to take a little cut all the way around and you girdle your tree. So when we tap our trees, we want to make sure that we are tapping them, or when you go and tap your trees, um, you're going to want the first year you tap it, preferably on the south side because that side of the tree warms up a little bit quicker and you get the, the sap flowing because the bark has to thaw out too to get the sap going up and down. You want to tap it on the south side. The next year you want to move it over and up a little bit so you're actually tapping them on a kind of a dangle and you rotate it around the tree so then you're not ever causing damage all the way around your tree. Yeah. Do you have any other questions about tapping? Uh huh. Like how big do they have to be before you start? At least, well, some people say 10, 10 to 12 inches would be ideal. So. A lot of people, we, maples are some of our most common trees in town. More than likely, you w drive up and down the street, you're going to be looking at a maple. Um, so tapping in town, if you can keep them from being disturbed by people, it, it, there's tons. We, tons of opportunities there. We have one outside of our house, but it's right next to the elementary school. And we just feel like it might be a little too tempting. <laughs> you said you need to go over and up. Chance girdling that way by going over each time? Go over, so we go over and then up. So it's never in a line all the way around. It's kind of like staircase. Okay, so there is a way yeah. for the, the, the island and all that stuff to flow through there. Yeah. Gotcha, okay. Yep. Very good. Uh huh. Does it make a difference how far you give a pass? Um, so it, it doesn't. Um, I would say that no more than um, what we would say di diameter at breast height. So breast height is kind of probably the max we want to go. We put ours lower because we run tubes down to buckets. And so that way, um, you know, we don't have to put as long as tube in to get down to the bucket more or less. So um, we'll probably eventually as we rotate have to put longer tubes onto our buckets to make sure we're not causing problems. Mm -hmm. Just completely depends on the year. Yep. Um, last year, so we've been kind of, well, we've kind of been dreading or panicking. I shouldn't say dreading. We've been panicking over this year because, well, Mother Nature has decided to give us this long winter, regardless of what Puxatani Phil says. And um, we feel like we're behind schedule because last year, this time, we were cooking down our sap and making syrup. But last year, we tapped um, end of February. And we collected uh, sap for a few days, and then it completely shut off for a week. And then we, it's picked back up and started going again. So this is kind of the fun part with the, the collection and the, and the data and the quantities. It kind of see historically what's going on. And we've also been keeping track of the temperatures and the weathers during that, weather during that day, trying to figure out what is making these trees flow and why kind of things. So we, we kind of, we tapped last Wednesday thinking that maybe this weekend we would get a little something, but with the cloudy weather, we found that cloudy weather is usually, it likes sunshine usually gives us a better day for um, sap collection. And we've also found that when it gets too hot, the trees will also shut off as well. So we're wanting to get days above freezing and nights below freezing is perfect and sunny days for collecting um, the sap. So, uh-huh. Is there a direct relationship between the diameter of the tree and how much you get? We have, uh, well, I guess we haven't really looked at that, but it, it would make sense to say probably um, because you put two taps in, so oftentimes you're getting more sap out of one tree. Although I'm not 100% sure, we haven't looked at that necessarily. We need to definitely compile all our data and figure out what all information, and I, I would love to put it all in charts and you know, compare it all, but we haven't, got, we haven't gotten that time yet. Uh-huh. I got a song for tapping. Oh yeah? If I had a hammer and hammer in the morning. <laughs> I would say, does it matter when you tap? Time of day? Morning or? We have, we've always tapped, well, we've tapped throughout the day because 153 taps doesn't 
it takes up all, quite a bit of the day to get those all in. So, um, so we've kind of tapped them throughout the day, but that would be interesting as well to keep track of. We tap these in the morning, and so, but we, so we've had our trees tapped, and we haven't had a single, well, very little sap has flowed. Um, and we kind of wonder also if the level of snow is not preventing um, the thawing out. I mean, more or less, we're waiting for the trees to thaw out. And so if your toes are cold and covered in snow, it's going to take a little bit longer to thaw out. Mm -hmm. Yes? When separating the water from the sap, do you know if the water has any nutritional value? Uh, no, but is that... <laughs> Not necessarily that it has any nutritional value, but they, it is some of the purest water you can possibly get. Uh, and people are actually selling that water. We're not selling that water. We do actually collect that water off of the evaporator. It's hot water, um, and we will use that to rinse out stuff over at the sugar shack and things like that. So if you get a chance to go over there, you'll see um, with the evaporator, we have a hood, and that um, collects moisture. There's actually a rim inside of it, and then there's a slope that goes down, goes down into a tube, and then out into a bucket, and we collect that water. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was like, uh, we're up on this bridge at the North Peak, uh, like where I was Vermont and all that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, so we are definitely in the far southwest corner. In fact, all of our equipment that we purchase comes from Wisconsin, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York. Our evaporator came from New York. Um, and whenever say, we say, oh, I'm in Marshalltown, Iowa, the one guy that I work with, um, he always is like, you guys are like, on the very edge of maple syrup making country, and we are. Um, and if you look at like the, dis the, the um, distribution of hard maples in the United States, their native range, we are literally on the edge of it. Not saying that, we do have quite a bit of hard maples that we plant. Um, and hard maples are really pretty good at naturally regenerating in the forests. So when we have problems with our oaks growing back up, oftentimes, it's maples that are taking over those forests because they can handle shade. And so if you go out to Grammar Grove in the spring and you look down on the ground, you see thousands and thousands of baby maples about this big. Now it'll take about 50 years for them to get to the size, 75 years to get to the size that we want them to be right now, like what we're tapping. Um, but you're looking probably at 15 years before you can finally put a tap in them. But, well, you know, one of the things that we're, th we're thinking about in this process is making sure that we're managing the trees and managing grammar growth so that way we have a healthy long-term supply of hard maples. Because the hard maples we are tapping right now are old. They're pretty much, we have old maples and baby maples. We don't have that middle-sized tree, so. Okay. I may have jumped ahead a little bit, so if I, I may, I'll try not to repeat myself too much. So sap collection. Um, so the kind of the old uh, tried and true were the metal buckets, and you can still find metal buckets. It is strongly suggested that if you find metal buckets to be careful because they used to be soldered with lead, and so um, you have to be concerned about uh, lead, lead contaminating your sap. But you can use something as simple as plastic milk jug. Um, and, and putting your, your uh, spile into the tree and hooking that milk jug on. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, on a good day, we get five gallons of sap in a five-gallon bucket. So if you put a little milk jug on there and it's a nice day outside, it's perfect weather, you may want to check it four or five times that day because you could be emptying it enough. And when you empty it that much, then you have to think about where am I going to put all this sap? You've got to put 40 gallons of sap somewhere to cook it down to get your one gallon of syrup. So just, just so you have that in your mind. You were saying five gallons, that's per tree or for your whole growth? That's per tree. No, actually, that's per tap. So it's not uncommon for us to get 10 gallons off of a tree. Yeah. Last year, there was one day that we collected over 300 gallons of sap from the sugar bush. So that would have been, yeah. So, yes, yes, there is. Um, so large um, producers, especially up in the Vermont area, places like that, they actually run tubes from tree to tree. And then it all goes downhill, or they have a, a pump that pulls it all downhill into a tank, and so they don't have to collect it. 
Um, we joke about whether or not someday we're going to do this. It's a whole nother process of learning. And we have found that um, someone told us it was a sickness. Maple syrup making is a sickness. <laughs> and that you just kind of keep growing and growing. And, and, and we found it to kind of be that way. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever go that route. Um, maybe. I don't know. What we do right now is this right here. So there's the spile in the tree. It runs down a tube into the bucket. And then we take that bucket and we dump it into our um, ATV tank. And that tank's about 75 gallons. In a good day, we have to take that tank down to a truck, pump it into a big 300 gallon um, tank in the, in the back of the truck. And then we bring it here to wow. cook it down. So, but it's a fun, it's fun. It's, it's fun to open up those buckets because you never sh know how much you're going to get. It's kind of like a present every single how time. Um, so what our evaporator we have now cooks down about 20 gallons per hour. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Um, so cooking down the maple syrup, it, it can be as simple as a pot over a fire. Um, you'll notice that it's a pot over a fire, not a pot over a stove. So if you've ever heard of anyone cooking down maple syrup in their house, you will quickly find that it produces, I mean, you're, you're cooking all that water off. And what that does is um, it's been known to peel wallpaper off of walls, uh, cause mold problems, different things because you're putting a ton of moisture into the air in your house so it can cause damage to your house. So we strongly suggest that you do not cook your maple syrup down over in your stove area. Um, because there is, a, huh? And paint. And paint, yep, a whole bunch of stuff. So, um, you know, we did our first year, actually, we had an evaporator. Um, this is what Jeremiah uh, uh, made, and it was just two buffet pans in a barrel, and we would throw firewood and then one in there to heat it up. And then when it got um, low enough in the amount of water, it started to get caramelized and um, thicker, we would bring it inside and finish it on the stove. So that way it didn't have a ton of moisture in it, but that way it helped, um, helped the process a little bit. We figured we could cook down about three gallons, or is it 30, 30 gallons in a day? I think it was 30 gallons in a day with our, um, with our little fat flat pan evaporator and we decided well this isn't very efficient. <laughs> and uh, it was fun and it produced a syrup that had a very um, wood, uh, smoky flavor to it. It was delicious. I loved it. And we come to find out that some companies and businesses actually add smoke flavor to their syrup to get that smoky flavor. Well, we were naturally producing it because the evaporator we had was not sealed completely. And so the smoke was just right there and it was, it was infusing into the liquid and it was delicious maple syrup. Um, so, so that was what we did the first year, and then we decided, okay, we've got to do something a little bit more efficient. So we purchased this modern evaporator down here, and it, it, is, it was intimidating. You know, you have this machine that you have to watch, because the thing with maple syrup is when you cook it down, it can go from sap, what you think is it, it's syrup, or like darkish brown syrup, to burning the bottom of your pan very quickly. But it takes a long time to get to that, oh, it's almost there, it's just perfect. And so when, um, when we were cooking it down in here, the first time it was like, is it ready? And we test it, is it ready? We tested it, is it ready? And we're like, oh my gosh, this is taking forever. And finally we figured out, okay, you just have to be patient, but when it's ready, it's ready, and you don't want to go any further than that. Because what that actually does is that if you overcook it, one, you're concentrating your sugars more than you need to, so you're losing the quantity of syrup you could have. And two, if it sits long enough on the shelf, it'll form crystals on the bottom of your maple syrup jar. So if you've ever seen a homemade maple syrup that has crystals on the bottom, it's nothing really bad. Although if you got judged, they'd say you overcooked it. Um, you condensed the sugars too much. But taste-wise, it doesn't affect it. So there's actually crystals on the bottom of that jar. And of course, if we had reverse osmosis, it would take us even less time because it would suck out all the, the or suck out a huge portion of the water, make the sap sugar concentration, the sugar concentration would be like 60% already, so it would take a lot less 
but you're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and that just even looks even more intimidating than our pretty little you, evaporator. You don't have that in your no. Just Someday when I win the lottery, okay. we'll have a reverse osmosis system out here. Um, so making the syrup. So we cook it, first you gotta cook it down to the correct um, density, which you have to use both the temperature and then we use a hydrometer. This is this thing right here. You can buy these at Tyson's and they're not all that expensive. It's a very simple tool. And you put, you fill your cup full of syrup. Then you gently set this in because if these break, they can break easily. You set that in there and then you kind of let it float. And there is these two red lines and you want to make sure that you're in between those two there. You want to make sure you're actually at 66.9 right over here. This one right here. So it'll float to that level. Once it floats to that level, then we know that our syrup is done. You can't have it too low. If you have too much water in it, it'll spoil. And that, <coughs> that legally, you can't have it that low. And then I said before, if you make it too dense, then you get the crystals that'll form on the bottom of your syrup. So we actually have a new, uh, we, we decided last year to invest in this Murphy cup. And this was nice because so the density is based off of the temperature and barometric pressures. And so you had to every day test your thermometer with boiling water to set it to the right temperature to know, OK, this day the water boils exactly at this temperature. And, and it got kind of complicated. And so we ended up using this Murphy cup. And what it does is you use your hydrometer in the cup. And when the hydrometer and this match, your syrup is done. And it's a lot, lot simpler and easier to use. If you have questions about this, Tyler is our expert on this, and he can answer your questions better than I can. Um, so then after the syrup is done, we filter it through uh, a wool filter and then into a canner and bottling the syrup. Uh, last year, the filtering was kind of our ah, process, and so uh, every year we learn you know, what do we need to do to make it better? And I'll talk a little bit about what we're gonna do this year to improve that process. And then we bottle them. So um, the reason why you filter is that the, there's a, a sugar, they call it sugar, uh, maple syrup sugar um, that is produced. It's actually niter. It's kind of like a dirty, sandy kind of material um, that uh, is, is made when you cook down the syrup. Some trees have higher levels of it than others. Silver maples and red maples tend to produce more of it. That's why we, we don't want to tap those maybe as much as the hard maples. But it's like almost, we call it mud. It looks like mud um, that forms. And so you want to filter that out from your maple syrup, but you also don't want your maple syrup to get too cold because you want to, if anyone's canned before, you want to make sure you're putting it in the jar at a hot enough temperature um, so that way bacteria cannot grow into it. So. That mud? Yeah. I don't know. One of our, Tyler, um, Tyler will eat anything. <laughs> um, and Tyler actually puts it on his toast and he swears it's delicious. Um, but it, it is a very odd texture and it, it's supposedly full of nutrients and stuff. Oh, Nutella? Um, uh, it is slime, it's just. I've never Googled recipes off of maple syrup niter, but I bet you they're out there and I can find, we could find something. I bet they are. So every time you cook that sap down, it produces that niter. So if it gets too cold in the filtering process, we had to cook it back down and then you get more niter. And so there's definitely a balance there. And that was one of the problems that we came up with last year and we had to find a solution for. Is that uh, a muslin then? For it's wool. wool. Mm -hmm. It's very thick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been kind of noticing like on different shows I watch that there are people that are adding different flavors to the maple syrup. Yeah, yeah, actually we were um, at Grammar Grove and we ran into a gentleman and he's like, you should put, he goes, I suggest putting a cinnamon stick in your maple syrup and letting it sit. And I'm like, oh, that does sound good. Yeah, well, but, what I like to, uh, is bacon. Oh, yeah, oh my gosh. Don't tell my director that. That sounds like something he would love. He'll make us make it all bacon flavored maple syrup. Uh huh. So, what flame does it make the maple sugar? Is uh, that what they use to call maple sugar, the niter, or is that something else? 
It's completely different. It's literal. It's it, niter is just kind of dirt and materials from the that are impurities that are from the the syrup itself when it cooks down. I, maple. So you can you can make maple cream. You can make maple candy. There's all these different things you can make, but it's cooking it to a higher temperature and a, 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 a higher density, and that's how they form. And if you are truly, if you are interested in this process, this book is mind-blowingly amazing. Um, and it, it's huge, it's scary looking, but it answers just about anything you ever want to know about maple syrup making, including how to manage your trees, look for disease, um, as well as making the different types of syrups and candies and things like that. So um, I, I, that was, I, we call it our maple syrup Bible because we go to it for everything. <clears throat> so a couple, back in 2017, we actually inventoried the trees at Grammar Grove because we started off with tapping 30 trees and we're like, okay, this is fun. Can we go bigger and get an evaporator? Because we had that flat, flat pan system and it was taking forever to cook it down, but we didn't know if we could actually get enough sap to get an evaporator. And so what we ended up doing is doing an inventory. Um, I knew a forester and he took me out. And my husband's the forester for the area in case. Um, and he took me out. We measured the diameter at breast height of all the trees. So we knew how large they were, how many taps we could put into them. We put whether or not they were in excellent health, poor health. Um, and then we GPS them all. So each of these dots up here, the bigger dots are the larger trees, the littler dots are the smaller trees. And then over here, this actually shows the crown health. So maple syrups that produce, they believe that produce higher levels of sap have healthier crowns. They're able to collect more sunshine, have, um, need more, pull up more um, fluids through their, their xylems and phloems. And so we also monitored how healthy their, their crowns were. Um, Grammar Grove a few years ago hit by, got hit by a windstorm. And so there are a few that have broken tops and things like that. And so with this, we were able to actually figure out, we started the first year and we tapped these trees in here. And they were great and wonderful, but what we found out is that we actually had a higher concentration over on this side that when we wanted to tap more trees, we could actually tap about 90 trees over here versus the 30 or 40 over here. And so we decided we moved our tapping area over into this area so we could tap more trees in one area. And um, it, it's always good education to go out and learn how to identify a maple tree in the wintertime because there's no leaves. And sometimes I just swear my husband says, well, it's a maple because it looks like a maple. <laughs> it's a maple. Can't you tell it's a maple? Is that a maple? No, that's an oak. Okay. I don't understand. So learning how to identify a maple tree, you get, you get better at it as it goes along because when you're out looking at them in the wintertime, those things you normally identify a maple by aren't aren't there, so. The, a large timber that's north of the Grand was the Queens. Yes. And they, I know at one time, they used to tap. Do they still tap? They do every other year. Every other year, yeah. And actually, he, we worked with him when we were first getting started, trying to figure out what we wanted to do for our evaporator, because we went and checked out what they had. Um, and there's just a lot in that learning process, and we saw what he did, but they produce a pretty small amount. Um, and, but, I mean, it is something that two people get together, they collect sap for a few days, they sit in the woods around a fire, cook down sap, and it, it's just something very social to them and an enjoyable time. And, and that's where it started out, and, and still for us as a staff, this is an awesome experience. We've learned a lot working together, problem solving. It's, it's, it's been a really fun off, uh, opportunity that everyone on staff has gotten to participate with. Yeah, I was one time I saw a big leaf. It was a leaf that had a red uh, bark on, on the top. The was it in the fall season, like when it was turning color? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, um, well, kind of in that background, it's amazing what those colors um, show up on. Usually it's hard maples, so the sugar and the black maple that have beautiful fall color, M mainly sugar maple. Black maple can too, but the sugar maple. And that's just that, that tree. You never know what they're going to give you after. Well, that. Uh, what was the other? Uh, 
I don't think so. I don't think so. But again, I mean, a lot of the potency of the sap is kind of unknown. They do sometimes clone trees that have higher sugar levels, so that way they can produce a sugar bush that has a higher sugar level throughout the area. Uh huh. I don't know if you've said or not that you like to start in February and go till when? Oh, well, the first year we actually tapped in January. January. And we went through the end of February. Uh, this last year. Yeah, about a month is a month is a really good probably period. We're we're hoping we get two weeks with this season. Really? Yep. But we don't know if since it's a more abbreviated season, if we're going to get higher amounts of sap during that period versus it being drawn out over a longer period of time. We don't. We just don't know what you don't. You never know. You just don't know. That's why we kind of want to collect the information to see if we could kind of figure stuff out as we go. Have you tried to run longer? Well, you can't go too far because if the buds open, it affects the flavor of the sap. It actually makes it have a fishy smell to it. And so, yeah, you don't want to mix that in with the rest. And, and um, yeah, not on your pancakes, right? Do you have other county areas like Grammar Grove that would have an inventory where you know what's there? So, Tim and Groves? We, we, so we do have other maples in our park. So when we first started this process, we were trying to figure out which park would be our best bet. Um, the thing is, is sugar maples, grammar growth is our highest concentration. Now, silver maples, um, we have silver maples in, in Timmins, in Furrow, all along the Iowa River is a large number of silver maples. Even if we went into Grammar Grove and down into the bottomland, there's a lot, sugar maples are a bottomland species. And so we can find, we can tap those trees as well. But again, with the sugar maples, shorter season, um, higher levels of nitre being produced, and also commonly lower sugar levels, but not necessary, necessarily. So there are other places we could tap as well, um, but this one keeps us pretty busy. <laughs> so this is what we did last year. Um, 37 or 35 gallons of syrup we uh, collected uh, for 33 days with 150 uh, taps, and we collected 2,217 2, gallons of sap. So once we cooked that down we had 35, and filtered it all out, we had 35 gallons of maple syrup. The year before, you'll see that there's quite a difference. We started off with 30 taps, and there's a story behind that, because Jeremiah and I were talking about it this morning, because we were asked what started this whole process, and Jeremiah and I can't necessarily remember if it was his idea or if it was my idea, but we kind of thought, oh, it'd be fun to do maple syruping. And I said, let's do 10 taps. And he's like, oh, that's not very much. We did 10 taps, and we were just getting itty bitty teeny tiny amounts of sap so we're like I was, he talked me into it he bought stuff and he's like he talked me into it and I'm like okay we'll do 30 and then all of a sudden the sap started flowing and their sap flows so you'll have a low amount of sap and then all of a sudden one day you'll have a huge sap flow and then you'll go back down and then you'll have another sap flow and there's about on average three large sap flows per season and so then we got our big sap flows, and then it became, oh my goodness, where are we going to store all this sap before we can cook it down? Because if you don't cook it down quickly, it can ferment and get bad. So we ended up borrowing a deep freeze from one of my coworkers that she had in her basement that wasn't working, and we froze the sap. And it became this whole, oh my goodness, what are we doing <laughs> process from 30 taps from 10. So I blame that on Jeremiah, because I said, let's just do 10. Well, we did 30. We collected for 27 days and had 358 gallons of sap and then um, made seven gallons of syrup out of it that first year. And of course, then we bring our syrup over to, um, to, for our pancake supper, so our, our pancake breakfast we have. Um, and then we also, last year we didn't, we didn't sell any from that first year. We just kept it all for the pancake breakfast. And then last year we had enough to be able to sell some. Uh -huh. uh, have you ever compared like with Hardin County that has a lot of public timber? Did, did, did they uh, do that also? They, uh, I know that they cooked maple syrup last year or two years ago, but I don't know the quantity. Jasper County actually just built a sugar shack and they bought an evaporator this last year. And they called us and they're like, hey, can you come show us how to run the evaporator? But I mean, that's how we learn too. We're like, okay, we have this evaporator, Jesse from Iowa State, come teach us how to run. It doesn't come with a manual. They didn't come with a manual. They didn't come with any directions on how to put them together. We got all these parts and we're like, oh, 
<laughs> what do we do? And so it, it is truly a, a skill that is taught from one person to the next, and it's kind of a neat tradition to, to teach uh, uh, each other. I heard that. Uh, <laughs> so. so 2019, we're look, this year, we sat down last year and said, these are the things that worked well, these are the things that didn't work well, this is what we need to do to improve it. Um, I think this is going to be something that we're constantly improving and making little changes to this first few years. It's kind of been some big tweaks with the evaporator and realizing, well, we have to have a more efficient way to cook it down. Well, we also realized that we needed a more efficient way to filter our um, syrup. And so what this is, is this is a filter press. Um, in between each of these metal uh, uh, bars is a piece of paper. And so what happens is the syrup gets sucked in and it goes through um, this filter press and then out into a pan. And then we put it in the canner, make sure it's to the right temperature, and then into jars. What's the uh, flooring uh, difference between pure, what you might buy Pure maple syrup? Yeah. So we're making pure maple syrup. And so Aunt Jemima is actually corn syrup flavored with low, low grade maple syrup. Um, what we learned was that the low stuff, the end stuff at the end of the season, the stuff that they use to clean out the tubes at the beginning of the season, they collect that and they sell that to companies like Aunt Jemima and they mix that in with the corn syrup to give you corn syrup, maple syrup. The fake stuff, we call it the fake stuff now. Uh -huh. And then pure maple syrup, what we make and what you can buy in the jar, and it is more expensive, is just sap that has been cooked down. There's nothing else in it besides tree sap. So there's not really flooring about it that, you know, one's higher than the other? Nope, nope. Well, probably the corn syrup is higher, but I honestly don't know. I'd, I haven't never compared the back. I used to love corn syrup, maple syrup, because that's what I grew up with, and that's what most people eat. Um, but now that we've had pure maple syrup, that's my children have known nothing else. They're, they're going to be so in shock when they actually have corn syrup. Maple syrup. So. Now, a filter machine like you're showing there, how do they collect that, that mud from there compared to so then you have to take, so there's actually kind of like clamps. You have to unscrew it, and so it gets collected. So there's pieces of filter paper in between each of those, and so as it pushes through, the fil it gets sorted out from that filter. And then at, after we're done filtering it through, we have to take it apart, pull out all those filters, and clean it. Um, we have to change the filters every single time. We also mix diamaceous. Every time, every time we filter the batch. So what happens is when we're on the evaporator, we cook it down. Um, there's a back pan and there's a front pan. The back pan is where the sap comes in, and it's all based off of density, the evaporator. So as the fluid gets more dense, it sinks and sinks and sinks and sinks. And so then it kind of goes through this maze, because there's flutes. There's pieces of metal that go up in the evaporator. What that pieces of metal does is it, it's, it makes a larger surface area so it, the water can cook off faster. And so as it gets more dense, it weaves its way down through the, the, the evaporator till it gets to the last flute, and that's where it's the most dense. And there's a spout right there, and then we can draw that off, and we draw that off. And usually it's about, I think it's about eight gallons, is, is eight gallons, six gallons, is what we can pull off of our evaporator. Now it's not quite, because our evaporator is so small, it is not quite to syrup level, so we have to finish it on a little canner. And so we cook it up to the right level, and then we filter it at that point in time. So we'll run it through this filter system. Last year, it was taking us hours to filter, hours to filter. Then what happens? It gets too cold. You have to heat it back up, heat it back up, produces more niter, then you have to filter it again. And it becomes this, this is not working process. So then you're doing smaller batches. And, and so, hence the filter press. So this can supposedly filter, uh, I think it's a, eight gallons in three minutes. So it'll pump it right through, yeah. One of the things you do have to do is add diamaceous earth to it, and it has a gigantic whisk. Uh, we, we whisk it in, and that will help the particles click cling to it, and so that way when it filters, it'll filter even clearer. And actually, diamaceous earth is used for beer making and wine making as well. They mix that in to help filter out stuff and, and make it clearer. Syrup. And corn syrup? I did not know that. Yeah. 
Oh. Technically forward. Oh. Or the maze, so. Yeah. Oh, when we shifted out the railroad cars. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can't even imagine that much corn syrup, <laughs> but I'm sure we go through it. <laughs> this here is not so much a teaching program, but it's a supportive program for your, this place? Yeah, so we use our funds to help improve pro stuff at Grammar Grove, as well as go back and help the, pro um, the project, the program itself, yeah. So a couple other things we did, and I'm, am I almost out of time, almost out of time, um, is we numbered all of the trees. So each of the trees, when you get up there, will have a, if you ever go up there, have a metal tag and it has the number on it. So we know each tree, 88 is a great producer, and this is how much, so that's, we can keep track of it a little bit better. And then the other thing we kind of splurged on this year is we had somebody make a, a, a a logo for us something to kind of whenever you see that you'll know it's Marshall County our bottles will have that logo on it and so um, it's something that was fun to do and also something important we thought we should we're going for real maple syrup here real maple syrup <laughs> well I don't think we'll put them out of business <laughs> molasses is a whole different beast I don't know Cane sugar? I, um, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, if you are interested, we will probably, I'm guessing next week, we will start collecting sap. If you have any desire to come up to Grammar Grove um, next week or find out when we'll be up there, I can get your name, uh, contact information, and we can shoot you an email or, or give you a quick call and let you know we're going to be collecting sap from this time to this time, and you can kind of see the process while we're up there. You can also tap walnuts. Um, as long as it isn't black. Oh, but is black walnut bad? The sap is poison. Hmm, I've never. Our guys want to tap walnuts, and I'm just like, I don't care what you do there. Uh, we've got this, right? <laughs> they they kind of keep it a secret. They keep telling me, well, if we ever get our walnuts tapped, I'm like, mm, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So, who would like some ice cream and? They taste the sap from the tree, and of course, you can, it, it tastes like water. Um, but then later that year, we allowed them to have some ice cream with the maple syrup, and it blew their mind that the, the sap that they had collected made that syrup. It was pretty fun. You're welcome. Babysit that 24 yep. hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody would like to go see the evaporator, it is hopefully up and running. The guys were going to put water through it because we don't have any sap yet, but you can see how it works. It is actually in the building across the bridge. So if you go across the bridge, you see the red building there. That's where the evaporator is at. So you can go over there at any point in time and visit it if you'd like. Did you guys ever calculate exactly how many? Gallons it cooks down in an hour. I think it's around 20. 20. I mean, you can do more, I think, but I think we figure around 20. Mm -hmm. It holds 40 gallons. Okay. So if you want to look, so that you can look in here. It's not boiling yet, so we just got to go. It's hot, yeah. So in there are the different flutes. So it actually is vertical. Oh, okay. And then it runs, so as it gets more dense, this is what we call the front pan. And this is, so it runs actually into here. So it's all controlled by floats to keep the level correct. And then you run it down. And so as it gets more dense, it passes through into here and then into here and then down into there. And so this is the evaporator. You had it timed last year every, it was 18 minutes or so that you had to put another piece of firewood in there to oh, keep, okay. keep temperature right. yep, yeah. because yeah. every time you actually de opened it up, we figured out that the syrup was actually moving back in. And so yep. we, you want, only want to open it up as much as you have to, but you want to try to maintain a set temperature so that way it cooks down. Yeah, we tapped, we tapped earlier last year, but we didn't start producing really well until the, I think it was the 12th through like the 19th. And like our best day last year was, for what day it was, but the high was 52 and the low was 21. And that was when we got the 465 gallons in a day. Wow.